Now on the History Channel, stories from the pages of time, stories of triumph and tragedy, adventure and achievement, as we go in search of history. No one knew they were stealing America's most important secrets. Soviet armed forces after the Second World War would not have been in the big league had it not been for American technology. Just how deep did Soviet agents penetrate into the US government? You know, as a former operative for the Soviet intelligence, I can't imagine myself bargaining with a US congressman about, about payment. But they did it. The guilt or innocence of people like the Rosenbergs, Alger Hiss, had been debated for years. The hunt for communists in the 1950s was a frightening time in America. And now, new information from the KGB files lends credence to some of people's worst fears about the spies among us. World War II is over and the world is being carved up by the victors. Half of Germany and all of Eastern Europe fall under the control of the Soviet Union. The Iron Curtain comes down. America's former ally is now America's enemy as battle lines are drawn in a new kind of war, a Cold War. Most Americans believe a showdown with communism is inevitable. Many also fear that communist spies are infiltrating American institutions and threaten our way of life. Believe me, you communists can't keep fooling the entire world. American politicians begin their assault against communism. I am holding in my hand a microfilm, a very highly confidential secret State Department documents. These documents were fed out of the State Department by communists who were interested in seeing that these documents were sent to the Soviet Union. Lives and reputations are put on the chopping block. From Hollywood to Washington, D.C., from the heartland to Manhattan offices, loyalty becomes an issue. And the question, are you now or have you ever been, is used to probe communist infiltration. I am not and never have been a member of the Communist Party. By 1948, the House on American Activities Committee has already pursued suspected communists for a decade. The most famous witness called before the committee is Alger Hiss. A Harvard graduate, Hiss clerked for Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes and later served as a State Department official and an advisor to President Roosevelt at the 1945 Yalta Conference. In 1948, Hiss is accused of being a Soviet spy. Many are skeptical about his guilt, including President Truman. The reporter said, do you consider these uh, investigations all red herrings? And Truman said, yes. When the House Un-American Activities Committee calls Hiss to testify in 1948, a freshman congressman from California, Richard Nixon, leads the pursuit. I have no apologies to the American people for my part in putting Alger Hiss where he is. Along with Nixon, Hiss's primary accuser is Whitaker Chambers. Mr. Hiss represents the concealed enemy. A Time magazine editor and former communist agent turned informer, Chambers claims Hiss was a member of his old communist cell. In 1950, Hiss is convicted of perjury for lying to a grand jury about knowing Chambers and about passing stolen State Department documents to him. I identified him on several grounds, which I think the record will show. While Hiss is grilled by Congress and a grand jury, government codebreakers are conducting their own investigation. They are hard at work deciphering wartime Soviet secret cables sent between Moscow and its operatives in the U.S. In 1946, they succeed in cracking the Soviet code. The newly deciphered cables are assigned a randomly chosen code name, Venona. And Venona offers disturbing revelations. There are more spies at work in America than previously suspected. So the war years are really the golden age, starting in the 1930s, but the, the, the golden era of Soviet espionage in the United States. The deciphered Venona cables are one of the best kept intelligence secrets of the century. The information is so classified that those who work on them are told by the National Security Agency to keep everyone in the dark, even President Truman. 
Meredith Knox Gardner was one of those code breakers. That's not my uh, fault. <laughs> uh, I don't know why they did that unless they thought that politicians in general, and especially powerful politicians, whom they couldn't browbeat into swearing that they wouldn't let uh, others know what was going on. I guess they just didn't trust politicians in general. Imagine if today, if an American president was denied access to a vital piece of intelligence information, heads would roll, and correctly so. The Venona cables remain a closely guarded secret for a half century, until 1995 and 1996, when the National Security Agency declassifies most of them. Like a time capsule from another era, the cables tell tales of spies who had infiltrated all aspects of American life. Spies in the State Department, spies in the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, even spies operating inside the top secret Los Alamos lab where the bomb was developed. One young physicist who works in the lab, Ted Hall, passes vital secrets to Russian agents that help the Soviets build their own nuclear weapon. Even though the FBI is on to Hall by 1950, they never arrest him. Exposing him would reveal to the Russians that the U.S. had broken their code. Hall goes free. Ted Hall, who now by his own admission, uh, gave the Soviets the most explicit information about the atomic bomb process. Hall was allowed to leave the country, emigrated to Britain, where he became a very successful, prominent scientist. There are other bombshells in the declassified Venona cables. The man who symbolized the so-called red witch hunts, Alger Hiss, is proved to have been a highly placed Soviet spy. Hiss is not only incriminated by Venona, but by a second source as well, damning new evidence found in the archives of the KGB. Alger Hiss was a source for the Soviet military intelligence. It's an absolutely different organization. But in those files, I found a lot of um, documents on Alger Hiss, naming him by his real name. I remember the phrase, with Alger Hiss as a source, one doesn't need anyone else. In 1994, officials in Moscow no longer have any reason to protect the secrets of the Stalinist era they decide to open portions of the KGB archives so that a history of Soviet espionage can be written for the first time. American historian Alan Weinstein joins with journalist and former KGB agent Alexander Vasiliev to examine the files. I am the first person who did any research in the archives. No one, including uh, people who were giving me the files, no one knew what was there. And uh, I found there are a lot of things which they didn't want me to find. Weinstein and Vasiliev embark on a remarkable journey of discovery. Each new file offers detailed information about Americans who collaborated with Moscow. The revelations in the KGB files also mirror the startling disclosures contained in the Venona documents. It's a bonanza from a historian's point of view. It's more than the famous Watergate two-source rule. It's the same source from their archives and from our archives. Uh, could I have expected any of that? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. The KGB files reveal startling details about Americans who spied for Moscow. But who were these people, and what drove them to spy for the communists? Most were motivated by high ideals, others by love, and in one case, just plain greed. When we return, a U.S. congressman sells information to the Soviet Union. One perfect day, Samuel Dickstein walked into the embassy and said that I could help you with spying on uh, Russian fascist organizations in America, but you will have to pay me. We go back to America in the 1930s. The Great Depression causes widespread unemployment. Many believe capitalism has failed. It's a fertile time for communism, and Moscow is looking for agents. People sympathetic to the cause, but who are not communists. Such people wouldn't be under suspicion and might penetrate to the highest levels of American society. 
One such man, however, is not a recruit, but rather a volunteer. Samuel Dickstein, born in Lithuania, is six when he is brought by his family to the United States in 1891, part of the vast tide of turn-of-the-century immigration. He rises through the political ranks of New York's Democratic Party, and in 1922 he is elected to the United States Congress. He is still serving his New York district during the most desperate days of the Depression. And this was a a Democrat from uh, New York City, a uh, Russian immigrant himself, Russian Jewish immigrant family, with uh, anywhere from 20 to 30 percent of uh, America either unemployed or underemployed, with poverty as widespread as it was, with uh, the rise of Adolf Hitler in Germany, uh, which was felt with special sensitivity by the immigrant Jewish population, uh, so much of New York. Uh, there was an especially fertile ground for the development of radical support organizations. This is the world Congressman Dickstein comes from. His constituents are primarily immigrants, refugees from political strife in Europe, and by the mid-30s, the political strife they are escaping is primarily fascist. The man was known as a person whose specialty was immigration, chaired the Immigration Committee in the House, but had his claim to fame was to have started the House process that led to the House on American Activities Committee. In 1934, Dickstein gains House approval for this special but temporary committee. Dickstein is appointed vice chairman, and John McCormick of Massachusetts is appointed chairman. During its first year, Dickstein tries to keep the committee focused on American Nazi sympathizers, but other members broaden the scope to include communists in America. We are organizing an army of the liberation of the people. KGB file number 15428. It is Samuel Dickstein's file, and it reveals one of the greatest ironies in the history of espionage. Samuel Dickstein, the man who created the House Un-American Activities Committee, becomes a paid agent of Soviet intelligence. But a greater surprise was that, unlike most of the people who spied, who engaged in intelligence work for the Soviets during the 1930s and 40s, most of the Americans, uh, who were uh, motivated by anti-fascism, by belief in communism. Dickstein did it for the money. It, it surprised me that no one inside the intelligence knew about this fact, but it didn't surprise me that some politician did such a thing. When former KGB agent Alexander Vasiliev first comes across Dickstein's file, he finds a description of an audacious, unscrupulous man who had one thing on his mind when he walked into the Soviet embassy in Washington, D.C. on December 20th, 1937. And said that I could help you with spying on uh, Russian fascist organizations in America, but you will have to pay me. And uh, he was asking for five or six thousand dollars a month, and they began bargaining. You know, as a former operative of the Soviet intelligence, I can't imagine myself bargaining with a U.S. congressman about, about payment. But they did it, and uh, they actually agreed on uh, 1250 dollars a month. For that price, Representative Dickstein tries to provide anything the Soviets might be interested in. We have a list of various items he passed, which would have been including the government internal budgets on how much the U.S. was spending on, on uh, military issues. Uh, there are a whole bunch of government documents that he is supposed to have passed, according to the files. But in this pre-World War II period, the Russians want Dickstein to investigate anti-Soviet groups in the United States. Dickstein was much happier spying on fascist groups or on monarchist groups for them. One of the things about the Soviet intelligence is they never stopped focusing on the tiniest of the remaining monarchist groups supporting a restoration of the monarchy in uh, the Soviet Union, nor did they stop focusing on Leon Trotsky's supporters, also a small band, even after they had assassinated Trotsky. Russian intelligence recognizes a golden opportunity when it learns that Dickstein's temporary anti-fascist committee will gain permanent congressional status as a standing committee. In what must rank as one of the boldest and most ambitious espionage ideas of the 20th century, Moscow directs Dickstein to gain control of the committee so he can use it to serve Russian ends. 
Uh, the idea was that he would steer away the investigation away from the communists and channel it uh, to pro-Nazi, pro-German elements in, uh, in uh, the United States. That was the paramount idea about Samuel Dickstein. It was a big political game. They wanted him to, to influence the U.S. Congress in this direction. However, Moscow's plans are thwarted in 1938 when a coalition of conservative Democrats allied with Republicans takes control of the House. The liberal Dickstein fails to even gain a seat on the new committee. His failure is a severe disappointment to his handlers. So is his greed. He had very negative uh, image in the eyes of the Soviets because the Soviets at the time were working with people ideologically inclined. The code name for American sources was compatriots. They were friends, colleagues. And this guy <laughs> was making money on uh, uh, a lot of things, and uh, they were so disgusted with him that they gave him this code name Crook, in Russian, Zhulik. This is the only case when I came across a pejorative code name. A memo in Dickstein's KGB file bluntly states, we are fully aware whom we are dealing with. This is an unscrupulous type, greedy for money, consented to work because of money, a very cunning swindler. After a year and a half and payments worth today more than $130,000, the KGB is finally fed up and ends its relationship with Congressman Dickstein. In 1946, Dickstein retires from the Congress and is appointed to the New York Supreme Court. He dies eight years later. No one ever suspects he was a paid Soviet spy until Weinstein and Vasiliev discover his file and reveal Dickstein's espionage in 1998. When we return, some spy for money, others for love. The regular diplomat sort of said to the intelligence folks, uh, by the way, I'm sleeping with the daughter of the American ambassador to Germany. Does that have any interest to in you? Between the two world wars, Stalin launches a ruthless campaign to transform the Russian economy and consolidate his power base. In the early 1930s, he reorganizes his state security agencies into the NKVD, which will eventually evolve into the KGB. One of the new organization's main concerns is the growing threat of Nazi Germany. Desperate to divine the intentions of this powerful new enemy, Moscow looks for agents who can circulate among the highest levels of Nazi society. The Russians find an American woman whose special abilities to combine charm and sensuality open the doors to Hitler's inner circle. What some of the Soviet controllers did was to combine uh, sexual athleticism uh, with espionage in quite an exciting way. In 1933, William Dodd, the newly appointed American ambassador to the Third Reich, brings his attractive 25-year-old daughter Martha with him to Berlin. Shortly after their arrival, she meets and falls deeply in love with Soviet diplomat Boris Vinogradov. She met the diplomat, uh, and to the best of uh, what the records reveal, uh, they enjoyed a love affair. And in the course of it, the diplomat, who was not an intelligence operative, but a regular diplomat, uh, said to the intelligence folks, uh, by the way, I'm sleeping with the daughter of the American ambassador to Germany. Does that have any interest to you? And obviously, it had a great deal of interest to the intelligence folks. And they said, from this point on, she's your assignment. Make sure she's happy. KGB file number 14449. It is Martha Dodd's file, and it contains orders from Moscow to Vinogradov in Berlin. They want him to turn his lover into a spy for the Soviet Union. The file also states that, according to our data, the mood of his acquaintance is quite ripe for finally drawing her into our work. The Soviets select a seasoned operative to be Dodd's contact. He passes as a reporter for the Russian news service Izvestia. Her KGB file clearly indicates why she has potential value to the Soviets. With the State Department's knowledge, Martha helps her father in his diplomatic work and is aware of all his affairs. Martha claims that the main interest of her life is to assist secretly the revolutionary cause. She was a major acquisition for the Soviets uh, because she uh, offered not only access to documents that her father left about his office she could wander in and out at will, 
For the Soviets, the kind of information Dodd can access might be critical to the survival of Russia in the event of war with Germany. I think that her information uh, about the correspondence between the U.S. Embassy in Berlin and the State Department was very important because in the late 30s, the Soviets were very concerned about by which road America would go in case of of a war between the Soviet Union and uh, Nazi Germany. That's why all this diplomatic correspondence was extremely important. In an extraordinary note from Dodd herself that Vasiliev and Weinstein discover in her KGB file, she makes it clear that she has access to material from the highest levels of the U.S. government, and she's prepared to do anything that might be asked of her. It goes without saying that my services of any kind and at any time are proposed to the party for use at its discretion. Currently, I have access to the personal, confidential correspondence of my father with the U.S. State Department and the U.S. President. In 1934, Dodd's Soviet lover Vinogradov is recalled to Moscow, yet she continues to assist the KGB by sleeping with the enemy. She also moved in the highest diplomatic and political and military circles. And mind you, took lovers in many of those circles, despite the fact that she, her primary lover, the love of her life, as she said, was this Soviet diplomat. But that didn't stop her from moving about and leading a very energetic social life, let me put it that way. The long list of her lovers eventually includes German aristocracy, members of the Gestapo, and General Ernst Udet, second only to Hermann Goering in the German Air Force. Dodd supplies Moscow with remarkably valuable pillow talk, a stream of confidential data about German military units, tactics, and procedures. She forwards reports of Roosevelt's informal and private discussions about U.S. policy toward Poland, Japan, Germany, and Russia. She even offers to use her influence with her father and others to help the Soviets handpick her father's successor. According to Dodd's KGB file, her handlers take the extraordinary step of asking Stalin himself how she might best be used. By 1937, war is imminent and Dodd's days in Berlin are numbered. Yet she still yearns for Vinogradov, who has been transferred back again to Moscow. Desperately, Dodd flies to Moscow and presents a letter to her KGB contacts. I, Martha Dodd, U.S. citizen, have known Boris Vinogradov for three years in Berlin and other places, and we have agreed to ask official permission to marry. This letter on several pages went straight to Joseph Stalin, and Joseph Stalin himself took uh, the decision to to continue using her as a source. Moscow delays responding to Dodd's request. Late in 1937, her father resigns his post as ambassador and Martha reluctantly returns to America. Unknown to her, Vinogradov is arrested when Stalin purges his diplomatic corps of those he suspects are disloyal. Before Vinogradov is executed, the KGB forces him to write to Dodd as if nothing is amiss. Martha writes back, unaware that her lover is dead. What I like about Martha Dodd also is that in a conversation, she once said, I have a weakness for the Russians. Uh, there is something in them. It's, it's very flattering, isn't it? In 1940, Martha Dodd is back in the United States. She marries and fades into the background, working as a spotter who identifies other potential agents for Moscow, including her husband. In the early 50s, an FBI investigation names her as a suspected Soviet spy. With her husband, she flees to Moscow and then Eastern Europe, where she lives out her days. In 1990, she dies at the age of 82. I think it's reasonable to think of uh, Martha Dodd as an American uh, Matahari to some extent, since, uh, you know, she did manage to combine sex and espionage in a personally fulfilling uh, way, I think. And particularly fulfilling to the Soviets were Martha Dodd's detailed accounts of German military plans and procedures, as well as her vivid descriptions of debates among FDR's inner circle during the critical years leading up to the war. It made her a very important Soviet asset in the 1930s. 
When we return, a red spy becomes the confidant of the Vice President of the United States. We now know who the Secretary of State to President Wallace would have been. It would have been Larry Duggan, a Soviet agent. KGB file 36857, Lawrence Duggan. In 1934, Duggan is a youthful idealist on the State Department fast track. Like hundreds of other young activists who come of age in the Depression years, he goes to Washington to work in Roosevelt's New Deal government. Soviet agents, among them Alger Hiss, soon identify him as a desirable recruit. Lawrence Duggan is typical of one kind of Soviet agent who was being recruited in the 1930s, not simply in the United States, but in Britain and elsewhere. That is to say, a high-flying, naive idealist. Larry Duggan did not become a Soviet agent for any mean or selfish motive. He started working for the Soviet Union because he thought it was the right thing to do. Here was a society which represented a kind of social justice that the West did not. Duggan is such an attractive prospect that two different Soviet spy networks compete to recruit him. According to his KGB file, in 1936, Duggan is drawn into the shadowy world of Soviet espionage by Hedda Gumpers, an anti-Nazi German exile and Russian agent. Duggan provides her with valuable information, including copies of diplomatic cables from U.S. embassies in Europe, as well as a copy of the classified State Department employee list and handbook. As Duggan rises in the hierarchy of the State Department, his access to valuable information increases, which naturally enhances his value to the Soviets. But he also learns more about Stalin's purges and the power struggles in Moscow. The news makes him uneasy. Even more alarming to Duggan are reports of defectors, former Soviet agents seeking to escape Stalin's reign of terror. One potential defector, Ignaz Ries, is in a position to blow Duggan's cover, but the Soviets are ruthlessly determined to protect him. Ignaz Ries is killed in part because of his knowledge not only of European agents, but because he knew via other parties of a number of the key figures in their American networks. A note in the KGB archives reads, Ries is liquidated but not yet his wife. So far, we do not know to what extent she knows about Duggan and what steps she will take in the future. Now, the danger that Duggan will be exposed because of Rees is considerably decreased. His secret intact, Duggan is promoted to the head of the State Department's Latin American division and then to the sensitive post of personal assistant to Secretary of State Cordell Hull. He also acquires a friend and supporter who could help him rise even further, the vice president, Henry Wallace. This country belongs to all of us, and we have got to keep it at work to keep it strong. In Larry Duggan, the KGB came closest to achieving the biggest success it had ever achieved in the United States. We now know that uh, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was terribly, terribly ill in 1944. In 1944, and for the previous four years, his vice president was Henry Wallace. Now, Henry Wallace had already worked out the major appointments in a Wallace administration. Had Roosevelt died in 1944, as it's entirely possible that he would have done, uh, then we would have had a President Wallace. And we now know who the Secretary of State to President Wallace would have been. It would have been Larry Duggan, a Soviet agent. It is among the greatest what-if stories in the history of espionage. This decoded Soviet cable indicates how close Russia came to placing an agent in one of the highest offices in the United States. Kinyats is the Russian codename for Duggan and Lotsman is Henry Wallace. The cable reads, if Lotsman gets an interesting post, it goes without saying Kinyats must get in on it by using his friendship. However, this scenario never unfolds, and Duggan's world begins to crumble when former Soviet agent Whitaker Chambers identifies Duggan as a secret communist to a State Department security official. He resigns his post as Secretary of State Hall's advisor and tries to cut off all contact with his former spy masters. But details in his KGB file show that he is relentlessly pursued by his Soviet handlers. One of the things that we tend to forget nowadays is the sheer tension 
that accumulated in some of those people in the United States who were working for the Soviet Union at the end of the Second World War. In December 1948, the FBI steps up the pressure on Duggan, questioning him about his relationship with Alger Hiss. Virtually on the heels of FBI questioning, the KGB comes knocking, demanding to know if Duggan talked. At 9 a.m. on December 20th, 1948, only days after his KGB interrogation, Duggan enters his office in New York. At 10 a.m., he plunges 16 stories to his death. Did he jump, or was he pushed? It's not certain that uh, Larry Duggan committed suicide. He certainly fell from a very great height, and it's a very unusual kind of, of accident. Duggan's KGB file lays bare the details of how thoroughly Soviet agents penetrated the State Department. But recently uncovered KGB files also reveal how deeply Soviet spies penetrated another U.S. agency, a very secretive agency, the Office of Strategic Services, the OSS. There were a number of specific agents within uh, the OSS who worked for the Soviets who uh, uh, passed along a variety of materials. Uh, and obviously, if you're running a foreign intelligence agency, it, it is useful, perhaps best, not to have double agents in your midst. Uh, the OSS had a number of them. KGB file 45049, Duncan Lee. Lee is a Yale graduate and Rhodes Scholar. When his mentor and former law partner, General Wild Bill Donovan, creates the Office of Strategic Services in 1942, Donovan recruits Lee to be his assistant. The ultimate dream for any intelligence agency is to recruit the head of another intelligence agency. Now, if you can't do that, recruiting his right-hand man is the next best thing, and Stalin got the next best thing, and his name was Duncan Chaplin Lee. Lee's broad access to OSS operations makes him an invaluable source. The cautious Lee provides no documents, but his tip-offs allow other Soviet agents working within the OSS to evade detection. The Soviet Union was uh, actually far more successful in gaining intelligence on its allies than it ever was against its enemies. And because its operations against its allies, Britain and the United States, were on so much a larger scale than its operations against its enemies, it was convinced for much of the war that its allies must be engaged in equally large operations against it. There is more than a grain of truth to that suspicion. Many American and British officials believe Russia will become the next big enemy after Hitler is defeated. They withhold from the Soviets the secret date of D-Day. If Russian generals know when the Second Front is to open, they might make their own plans to put a stranglehold on Nazi territories in Eastern Europe. But according to the KGB archives, Duncan Lee gave his Soviet contacts top secret details about D-Day. A note citingly as its source is found in his KGB file. It is dated March 3, 1944, and reads, The Second Front will be opened between mid-May and the beginning of June. If they believed Lee's information, the Russians were now privy to the most important secret of the war. By 1944, Lee believes that he is losing his cover and suspects that American counter-espionage agents are closing in on him. He got scared to death because he, as, a, as an American operative, he uh, realized that all of them, all of them, all of Soviet sources inside American government organizations, sooner or later, would be discovered. As the war draws to a close, many of those who worked for the Soviets in the 30s and early 40s now regret their actions. Lee is among them. He is haunted by the implications of his wartime contact with the Soviets. He severs all ties with Russian agents. In 1948, his worst fears are realized when he is identified along with Alger Hiss and Duggan as a suspected Soviet agent. Investigated by the FBI, he is never charged with any crime in part because the investigations had no access to the evidence recorded in the Venona files. He is one of a number of OSS officials who provided information to Russia, but who escape indictment for exactly this reason. When we return, the leaks don't stop. An American gives the Soviets technology that changes the balance of power in Asia.
Soviet armed forces after the Second World War would not have been in the big league had it not been for American technology. One of Joseph Stalin's highest priorities during World War II was achieving military parity with the United States. He realizes the fastest and easiest way to do this is by stealing the necessary technologies from America. America was uh, a perfect uh, place to steal military technologies. They were stealing everything from planes and tanks and ships to elevators in houses and even lipstick. They needed lipstick, so they stole it in America. The most important single secret that Soviet spies smuggle out of the U.S. are designs for an atomic bomb. But Stalin is not easily convinced that he has gained anything of value. Stalin was one of the most suspicious men ever to lead any major power in the 20th century. So that, you know, even when he'd got the most remarkable secrets from another country, he always thought, hmm, am I being fooled? And it took him four years to realize that he'd really been given the plans of the atomic bomb. In the spring of 1949, Igor Korchartov, the leading Soviet scientist in charge of the Russian atomic bomb project, actually takes plutonium sealed in a football-shaped casing to a meeting and hands the casing to Stalin. Stalin said, hmm, um, how do I know? How, convince me. How do I know that this is really is a nuclear charge? And then Korchartov says, if it was simply a lump of sparkling metal, it would be cold but it's warm, isn't it? Why is it warm? Because the alpha disintegration has begun. And a few months later, that uh, American football containing a plutonium charge was successfully tested um, uh, at the Kazakhstan test site. So in September 1949, the nuclear age came of age. Both sides had it, but they both had American weapons. Some of the atomic secrets are stolen by a Los Alamos machinist recruited by Julius Rosenberg, who runs a Soviet spy ring. Rosenberg and his wife Ethel are executed for atomic espionage in 1953. It's tragically ironic that Julius Rosenberg should have been executed for one of his sidelines. What we now know is that the, uh, the Rosenbergs, Julius Rosenberg, with some help uh, from his, uh, his wife Ethel, was running one of the biggest scientific and technological espionage uh, uh, networks in the history of the, of the United States. One of the key links to the illegal transfer of American technology to the Soviets is William Pearl, who is also a member of the Rosenberg spy ring. In the mid-1930s, Pearl joins a branch of the Young Communist League while a student at the City College of New York. After earning his engineering degree, Pearl goes to work for the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, where he helps design streamlined aircraft bodies and revolutionary new propulsion systems for a futuristic new class of aircraft called jets. By then, he is also a Soviet agent. He was one of the principal architects of uh, jet engines and the prototype for the MiGs that were used by the Russians uh, to fight in Korea during the Korean War were the designs given to them by William Pearl. On June 25, 1950, North Korea attacks South Korea. One of their most effective weapons is the Russian MiG-15, the Soviet Union's first jet fighter. The American-dominated United Nations forces engage the MiGs with propeller-driven fighters, but the MiGs are far superior, and the UN forces suffer heavy losses. Only when the US Air Force begins deploying the Sabre, America's first jet fighter, does the balance of power shift in its favor. It will be decades before the world learns the ironic truth. The West was almost beaten by its own stolen technology. As a result, the war in Korea ends in a stalemate, in part thanks to William Pearl. What I think hasn't been realized until quite recently is that the first American atomic bomb is not the only thing, far from the only thing, in American weaponry that the KGB is providing the material to copy. Jet engine is, uh, is another. Uh, Soviet armed forces 
after the Second World War would not have been in the big league had it not been for American technology. And they depended throughout the Cold War even more on American technology than they did on Soviet technology. It is 1960, and William Pearl's treasonous activities blow up on the world scene on May 1st. While flying at 60,000 feet over the Soviet Union in a U-2 spy plane, Air Force Captain Francis Gary Powers is shot down. Powers is captured and imprisoned, a major propaganda coup for the Soviets. But how was Powers U-2 detected? with American-issue technology, radar. The radar used to spot and target Power's plane is based on plans stolen by Pearl and passed to Russia through the Rosenberg spy ring. If you just take atomic espionage, you put together all the data they got from their collective spies, of which we now know there were certainly a good many. Uh, this enabled them to make progress years ahead of time. The files of the KGB reveal that the Soviet Union had indeed penetrated to the very heart of America's most hallowed institutions. The knowledge they gleaned and the technology that was stolen reshaped the world for most of the 20th century. To ex-KGB agent Alexander Vasiliev, the revelations in the files of the KGB offer human as well as historical insights. For me personally, it was important why they did it and how from the professional point of view, how, and from the moral point of view, uh, why. The tragedy of these people is that they did what they did in the 30s and the 40s, but they were judged and condemned in the 50s, 60s, 70s. These were absolutely different situations, absolutely different climate in America, and uh, I'm sure they wouldn't do that in, in the 50s, what they did in the 30s. They were not working against America. No one asked them to work against America. One of the most intriguing unanswered questions is how the publication of the KGB files and the historical insights they offer will play in the former Soviet Union. I'm hoping that they will not view the new revelations here, that some of which, uh, many of which perhaps they would have preferred not to have come out. I'm hoping that they see that in, in the context of what happens when a country deals honestly with its own past. No country has a future until it can deal honestly with its past. The KGB files reveal a history of Russian spies that is much larger and more complex than previously suspected. But the files also show that the great heyday of Soviet espionage in America had faded years before the Red Scare created a period of national paranoia. The revelations from the KGB archives are a bracing reminder that our familiar world, the shared past we thought we knew, is not fixed and unchanging. History, the KGB files remind us, may be as full of surprises and potential change as the future. <laughs>